we now have a panel on Alzheimer's disease therapies. Before I change hats and become a panelist, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Andrew Pieper. Andrew is director of our Center for Brain Health Medicines and is also an investigator with us, focusing on neurodegeneration. He has grown our center's capabilities tremendously, and we are fortunate to have him. He is a psychiatrist, a neuroscientist, and a professor at Case Western Reserve and University Hospitals, and our affiliate VA medical center, where he maintains an active clinic. Dr. Pieper has received many awards and is an elected member of ASCI. He graduated from Earlham College and earned his MD and PhD in neuroscience from Johns Hopkins. Here's Andrew to moderate. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm very pleased to be here today to tell you all about the efforts and accomplishments of our Center for Brain Health Medicines in advancing new treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Although it was discovered over 120 years ago in 1906 by doctors Alloy Alzheimer and Oscar Fisher, there has still only ever been a small handful of medicines that have been approved for treating medicines with this affliction. Sadly, none of these medicines show efficacy beyond short-lived minor improvement in symptoms and none of them slow the progression of neuronal cell degeneration and death that drives the disease forward. If we don't find new ways to effectively treat Alzheimer's disease, we will soon be facing a devastating humanitarian crisis. In the United States alone, there are currently about 6 million people suffering from Alzheimer's disease. With a rapidly aging population, it is projected that five times as many people will be living past the age of 90 by 2050. This will result in upwards of 14 million people in the US alone living with Alzheimer's disease. If at that time we are still limited to our current medicines and technology, the cost in human suffering and financial strain to society will be crippling. To avert this crisis here at the Center for Brain Health Medicines, we are looking beyond the traditional areas of Alzheimer's therapy and taking a more diverse approach to improving the lives of patients. To date, we have funded 16 scholars in the field of Alzheimer's disease across 15 different institutions. These efforts have led to the launching of one new company, licensing of one new drug to pharma, resulting in two new medicines currently in clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. Thus far, our primary partner in this endeavor has been the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, and this has been a highly productive partnership. I want to take this opportunity to let everybody know that our annual call for applications to this program opens June 1st with letters of intent. This year, we are especially focused on applications addressing neurovascular health and epigenetics in Alzheimer's disease, although all novel approaches are welcomed. Recently, we also received a very generous donation from the Vinnie family here in Cleveland to expand our efforts in developing new treatments for Alzheimer's. I'll talk more about that later. First, however, I want to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Jerry Rook from Vanderbilt University. Dr. Rook is a 2015 Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation Harrington Scholar who is developing novel drug candidates targeting synaptic receptors in the brain, long thought to play a key role in Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Rook received her PhD in pharmacology from the University of Kansas and then pursued her postdoctoral studies in the laboratory of Dr. Khan at the Vanderbilt Brain Institute. Here is Dr. Rook to say more about her exciting work. I'd like to thank the Harrington family and the Harrington Discovery Institute for the opportunity to share our journey and advancing our clinical candidate VU319 into first in human trials and to share our experience in working with the Harrington Discovery Institute um, through their scholars program. Alzheimer's disease is a very chronic debilitating neurodegenerative disease that affects millions of people. And unfortunately, there is no cure for the disease. The disease results in severe learning and memory loss. And ultimately these patients succumb to their disease. And our program is focused on developing treat new treatment strategies uh, for Alzheimer's disease and, and a help to cure or at least slow the disease progression. Now, as I said, Alzheimer's disease um, is, severe, is a severe learning and memory disorder. And we know part of the pathology associated with Alzheimer's disease 
um, is associated with the decrease of a chemical in the brain called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a chemical in the brain that's essential for learning and memory, and it's drastically diminished in Alzheimer's patients. And one of the current standard of care for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease is to try to ad address this pathology. And what the, the current standard of care with drugs such as denepazil are attempting to do is increase the overall levels of acetylcholine in the body. Uh, unfortunately, by increasing this chemical throughout the entire body, it increases the activity of a lot of proteins throughout the body um, that are not in the brain and they're not essential for learning and memory. And they, it results in severe adverse uh, effects in humans. And these adverse effects include uh, gastrointestinal distress, dizziness, uh, drowsiness, uh, and many patients are unable to tolerate the medication. In addition, uh, while it may provide some or temporary um, enhancement of learning and memory, um, it's not a permanent treatment um, and individuals with Alzheimer's disease continue to progress. So our program is focused on increasing the activity of a specific protein in the brain that is targeted by acetylcholine called the M1 receptor. The M1 receptor is essential in learning and memory. And if you diminish its activity as a result of the decrease of this chemical in the brain, it results in significant learning and memory loss. And so we have been developing drugs that specifically increase the activity of the M1 receptor in the brain. And by doing so, we hope that we are able to restore uh, normal learning and slow uh, the loss of memory in the, in the brains of Alzheimer's patients, while, all while avoiding the adverse consequences that are associated with the current uh, standard of care. At the time when we began um, working with the Harrington Discovery Institute, we had just uh, declared what we call our clinical candidate. And so this is a compound that we believe has all the necessary properties um, to provide the desired effects that we want in humans um, and to be advanced into clinical trials. Unfortunately, this is a phase in drug discovery um, that we refer to as the valley of death. Um, first of all, the financial resources required to advance through this stage of drug discovery are extremely astronomical. Um, and in addition, uh, the scientific expertise that's required to get through all of these safety um, studies to prove that the drug would be safe to give to humans, that expertise is largely um, absent in an academic setting. And so the Harrington Discovery Institute not only provided us um, with funding to complete these studies, but they also um, organized this terrific um, scientific team of experts um, that have years of um, expertise in drug discovery and advancing you know, compounds all the way from the bench side um, to the bedside or into the clinic. And so we worked with these um, individuals to advance our compounds um, through all of these safety pharmacology and toxicology studies that were required um, to receive FDA approval and advance um, our current compound into clinical trials. Um, these studies are laborious and take quite a long time. Um, and the team really persevered uh, with us through the tier, two year uh, scholar phase that we uh, were engaged with them. And we were able to successfully navigate this phase. Uh, we completed all of our safety uh, pharmacology and toxicology studies. Uh, we submitted an investigational new drug application to the FDA and received approval from the FDA to take this compound into first in human studies um, and begin our clinical trials. And so um, I'm happy to announce that we have successfully navigated uh, into the phase one clinical trials. Those began at Vanderbilt University uh, with Paul Newhouse as our clinical collaborator. Um, however, since then uh, we have partnered, um, we've entered into an exclusive licensing agreement and research contract with Acadia Pharmaceuticals. And so in partnership with Acadia Pharmaceuticals, we are now advancing these, uh, this drug through clinical trials um, and with the hopes um, of developing a new drug for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. 
Now these uh, studies and the progress that we've made in the years um, since partnering with Harrington Discovery Institute um, largely would not have been able to do be done without their expertise. I would like to thank the Harrington Discovery Institute, first of all, for all of um, their guidance, their scientific expertise, um, as well as the Harrington family um, for their continued commitment to academic drug discovery um, and the improvement of human health. Thank you, Dr. Rook. And now I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Steven Strittmatter from Yale University. Dr. Strittmatter is the Vincent Coates Professor of Neurology, Professor of Neuroscience, and Director of Cellular Neuroscience, Neurodegeneration and Repair um, Program at Yale. Dr. Strittmatter has a long-standing interest in ligand receptor interactions and signal transduction in translational neuroscience. He developed expertise in the biochemistry of neuronal receptors during his MD-PhD training with Solomon Snyder, who is a Harrington Scientific Advisory Board member um, at Johns Hopkins. He pursued neurology residency training at Massachusetts General Hospital under the guidance of John B. Martin, Raymond Adams, and C. Miller Fisher. He is also a 2020 Harrington Scholar Innovator. Here now to say more is Dr. Steven Strittmatter. Okay, well, th thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be able to tell you about our research, uh, in particular on Alzheimer's disease. Our goal is to recover synapses and therefore neural network function in the Alzheimer's brain. So here's a few uh, general comments about Alzheimer's disease. This is a picture of what happens to the Alzheimer's brain. It's pretty dramatic. On the left is a healthy brain. And when Alzheimer's becomes severe, the entire brain weight decreases. And you can see that uh, from an autopsy section shown here. What happens inside the brain as this overall shrinkage has happened? That's shown on the right side here. There's two major histologic markers of Alzheimer's disease, and you've probably heard about these, plaques and tangles. The plaques are these um, large circles. They're actually bigger than a cell in the brain. This is a cell. These plaques are quite large, and they're composed mainly of amyloid beta. And then within neurons, these neurofibrillary tangles, which are shown dark here in the silver stain, accumulate. So this is the process of Alzheimer's. The brain gradually gets smaller, all sorts of functions, but in particular, cognitive and memory functions are lost. These molecules accumulate. And it's a massive problem. Today, there's an estimated to be 6 million in the US with Alzheimer's disease. The drugs we have really provide only slight symptomatic benefit. They don't change the course of disease. Uh, there's either no or very limited benefit um, from the one drug that's been approved uh, for disease modifying therapy. So I mentioned our focus is on synapses. So this is a, a little diagram that shows a healthy neuron the cell body is in the middle. It makes all these long processes. And then it contacts at each of these little white dots another cell. And it's from one cell to another that uh, neural transmission happens. An electrical signal comes down this cable, a chemical is released, and then um, a signal occurs in the second cell. And you build up with millions and billions of, of these connections in the human brain. What happens in Alzheimer's as these plaques and tangles develop are that these synapses are lost. And this correlates well with the learning and memory deficits that happen. So this is from an Alzheimer's brain. These are the plaques, there's tangles in the neurons, but now there's many few of these connections between one cell and another. And there's lots of evidence that this amyloid accumulation triggers this whole process. This is a timeline of Alzheimer's disease, which is actually on the order of 20 or 30 years. There's 10 to 20 years of a pre-symptomatic stage where amyloid accumulates in the brain, 
once it reaches a high level, then changes start to happen in people's lives. Mild cognitive impairment is when synapses start to be lost and then tau accumulates and eventually we reach dementia where people can't continue their normal functions in life. A lot of these trials that have tried to remove amyloid from the brain have been done in this phase and haven't worked too well. And part of the problem is that all of the amyloid accumulates much earlier before this. What's happening at this stage during synapse, uh, during um, the early stages of symptomatic disease is that synapses are being lost. So our focus is on these synapses. This is a little more complicated diagram, which goes into what we've discovered is happening there. So what this shows in blue here is part of the neuron. Each of these little bulbs is where that cell is gonna contact another neuron. The aggregated proteins like the amyloid, extracellular tau, these target to synapses. In addition, the inflammatory cells in the brain react to aggregated protein and release mediators. Both of these things hone in on the synapse. And that's shown what happens in a molecular sense in this diagram. And these are from discoveries um, that we pursued at Yale. We found that these aggregated proteins interact with a synaptic protein called PRPC or cellular prion protein. And then this triggers a signaling event in the neuron that involves mGluR5, a number of kinases, this links to tau and regulates synapse function and eventually synapse loss. This complex also recruits these immune mediators, including complement proteins to the synapse. And together, all of this um, causes synaptic damage. And it opens an important uh, different aspect uh, to approach Alzheimer's. We're not trying to remove the aggregated protein or prevent the inflammation that's in the brain. Instead, even when those are there, we're trying to protect these synapses through these molecules that are present right at the synapse. How did we get to this stage? Uh, first, we looked for how a beta interacts, amyloid beta interacts with neurons. Here is actually amyloid beta sticking to neurons in a dish. It does so very well wherever there's dark. We then looked at all the genes that are expressed in the brain and found one that would produce this kind of binding to a non-neuronal cell, and that was cellular prion protein. And this protein is required um, for synapse loss. That's shown here. In a dish, there's a neuron with some of these synaptic specializations. Amyloid causes them to go away. But if this neuron doesn't have prion protein, these synapses are stable. And that uh, plays out in mouse models of Alzheimer's. This, these are from mice that have been trained in a water tank to go to this location here. And wild type mice, if they get trained and then retested, they go there. But these are Alzheimer's mice that have amyloid in the brain. They really can't learn where to go. You can see the big difference. If we take prion protein out of these mice, the mice behave just as well as wild type uh, animals. And so that leads to the key um, direction we're pursuing <clears throat> that if we block prion protein with therapeutics, synapses and learning can be restored. And importantly, we've demonstrated now that that's true <clears throat> in animal models. Um, this can occur without getting the amyloid out of the brain and without preventing inflammation. So um, this is the path that we're seeking to develop uh, therapeutically and with Harrington's help. Um, so I wanted to make a few major points here. Synapse preservation and restoration is distinct from removing protein aggregates. 
These two proteins I talked about, prion protein and mGluR5, are novel targets in the Alzheimer's field. And we've developed uh, or founded a company here through Yale called Alex Therapeutics uh, with Harrington support. And we're pursuing three approaches to this. One to target prion protein is kind of straightforward, a fully human antibody. And that's now in development for scale up and IND enabling study. The second is a, another way to target prion protein. And this, these are short polymeric chemicals, which are orally available. They work in animal models. And we're working to optimize the exact structure of these now. And that's the specific project that's been supported by Harrington. And then targeting GLUR5, um, we're using a silent, silent allosteric modulator that's orally available. It's efficacious in mice. We've now opened an IMD, and that's in uh, phase one clinical studies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Strittmatter. You heard earlier from Jonathan Stamler as the president and co-founder of the Harrington Discovery Institute this morning. Now, I will introduce him in a different capacity as the Robert S. and Sylvia K. Reitman Family Foundation Distinguished Professor of Cardiovascular Innovation, Professor of Medicine and Biochemistry. Dr. Stamler received his MD from Mount Sinai School of Medicine and did his postdoctoral training at Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School. He is internationally acclaimed for his discovery of protein S nitrosylation, a post-translational signaling system that controls cellular function from bacteria to humans. All classes of proteins can be modified by S nitrosylation, and aberrant S nitrosylation plays important roles in disease, ranging from heart failure to Alzheimer's disease to cancer. Now, he is here to tell us about his work on real-time monitoring of S nitrosylation of hemoglobin in our blood as a protective mechanism for the aging brain that could help slow or prevent Alzheimer's disease. Thank you, Andrew. Next, let me just acknowledge conflict of interest. Next. And with that, it's a pleasure to share with you our work, which is motivated by the idea that a decline in brain blood flow is a root cause of dementia, and that improvement in blood flow can prevent cognitive decline. Because for all the failed efforts to develop treatments for Alzheimer's disease, we have one therapy that works physical exercise, next. And the idea behind exercise is that it increases blood flow in the microcirculation, the small blood vessels that actually nourish the brain. Exercise not only improves brain oxygenation, but also cognitive function. It increases hippocampal volume and stimulates the growth of new neurons. And in clinical studies, Aerobic exercise is beneficial in both prevention and progression of Alzheimer's disease. But how much exercise and in what form is unclear. We really don't know how to optimize exercise for brain health since we don't know how to control brain blood flow. Next. Now we've recently discovered that a molecule called nitric oxide, NO, is released from hemoglobin in red blood cells to dilate small blood vessels and improve brain blood flow. Next. And the primary stimulus to release of nitric oxide in the brain is actually carbon dioxide, CO2, the waste product that builds up in hypoxic tissues. Nitric oxide, NO, then opens small blood vessels so that red blood cells can enter tissues and deliver oxygen. Next. Here in red color, you can see an increase in brain blood flow in normal animals exposed to increasing amounts of carbon dioxide. And in green, we have mutant animals unable to generate NO nitric oxide from red blood cells because the binding site for nitric oxide in hemoglobin, cis-93 or C-93, has been removed. These animals lacking nitric oxide can't increase brain blood flow. Next. Also, blood-brain barrier permeability 
a measure of brain injury is increased in these animals lacking nitric oxide and unable to increase blood flow. That's the green label. And blood-brain barrier permeability is frequently associated with cognitive decline. Next. And we confirm here in experimental models of Alzheimer's disease that mice lacking nitric oxide in their red blood cells, the green label, have cognitive impairment. In this case, a failure to recognize new objects. It stands to reason then, if we could increase the amount of nitric oxide released from red blood cells, we could better oxygenate and nourish the brain. But we currently have no way to measure nitric oxide in tissues non-invasively. Next slide. To this end, we've now developed the first wearable device to measure nitric oxide released from red blood cells in real time. And the scales truly have been removed from our eyes. Next. So first to know, the most powerful stimulus for nitric oxide production is exercise. Here are some of the first measurements ever made in humans. Here is an exercising individual who undergoes repeated bouts of exercise. With each bout, the nitric oxide level rises and then falls as the individual rests. The higher, the better. More nitric oxide from red blood cells means better blood flow to brain, heart, and muscle. Next. And not all exercises are alike. Here's another individual undertaking two different forms of exercise, running and biking, each producing different amounts of nitric oxide. Bottom line, exercise should probably be individualized to maximize nitric oxide. You should want a pelotonic structure that increases your blood flow to your brain. Some exercises are in fact detrimental to nitric oxide. It's not the case that more is better. Next. Now we have in medicine, a gold standard for fitness. It's called VO2 max. It's the amount of oxygen consumed by a person during exercise. VO2 is measured in a lab using sophisticated equipment, as shown here in green for an individual on a treadmill. Notably, patients with Alzheimer's disease have decreased VO2 max compared to aid matched controls. They use less oxygen. Now it's a little known fact that VO2 max is largely dependent on microvascular blood flow, which I have shown you is controlled by nitric oxide from red blood cells. And here in red, we confirm that a nitric oxide based algorithm, which we call UO2 for usable oxygen, tracks VO2 precisely. So nitric oxide can be used to accurately predict VO2 max. In other words, nitric oxide levels during exercise should predict risk of Alzheimer's disease and higher nitric oxide should protect against dementia. It stands to reason then that exercise protocols should be optimized to maximize nitric oxide, particularly in seniors, APOE4 carriers and patients with cognitive decline. And that NO targeted exercise may benefit Alzheimer's patients and perhaps all Americans as they age. Thank you. Finally, next, let me recognize funding by Harrington Discovery Institute, the Harrington Family, University Hospitals, American Heart Association, Allen Foundation, and NHLBI. And the individuals who did this work, particularly Rongli Zhang, Evan Picon, Richard Premont, and in Andrew's group, Natasha Dar. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for sharing this very exciting work. Now, I have the pleasure of announcing a new program that launched this spring, which I mentioned briefly in my opening remarks. For more than 10 years, Linda and Les Vinnie have generously supported genetics research and counseling at the UH Seidman Cancer Center. Now, their most recent gift to the Harrington Discovery Institute Center for Brain Health Medicines will help fund the development of novel treatments for Alzheimer's disease. The Vinnies have committed $2 million to establish the Linda and Les Vinnie Scholar Program in Alzheimer's Disease. Their gift also creates the Linda and Les Vinnie Acceleration Awards, which will assist the Vinnie Scholars and other Harrington Discovery Institute Scholars with their research on Alzheimer's disease. 
I'm very pleased to, to let you know that today we have with us the first awarded scholar in this program, Dr. Nabil al -Kayed. Dr. al is Professor of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine and Director of Research in the Knight Cardiovascular Institute at Oregon Health and Science University. He also holds the James Metcalf Chair in Cardiovascular Research. He is an elected fellow of the American Heart Association Stroke Council and has published more than 120 scientific papers on cerebral small vessel disease, experimental stroke, and vascular dementia. Today, he will share an overview of his work which focuses on developing a drug for aging-related dementia due to diseases of small blood vessels in the brain, adding perspective on the importance of blood flow as just discussed by Dr. Stamler. The small blood vessels of the brain are a major component of the interface between the vascular system and the brain, and the name of that interface is the neurovascular unit, abbreviated as the NVU. Because the brain cannot store its own energy, it needs rapid on-demand delivery that perfectly times increased blood flow to increase regions of neuronal activity. This, along with maintaining what is known as the blood-brain barrier to protect the brain from exposure to potential toxins in the blood, is the function of the NVU. Notably, early and progressive deterioration of the NVU is one of the most prominent aspects of Alzheimer's disease, and Dr. al is developing a new way to preserve health of the NVU with potential to slow or even stop progression of Alzheimer's disease. Here now is Dr. al to say more. Thank you, Andrew. It's an honor to be the recipient of the Venice Scholar Program Award. Uh, the title of my talk and the title of my uh, uh, Venice Program application is GPR 39 as a therapeutic target in vascular cognitive impairment and dementia. And I'll be referring it to it as VCID. So there are currently 50 million people worldwide living with dementia. The number will almost double every 20 years. So by 2050, the number of people living with dementia will exceed 150 million people. Worldwide, the cost of dementia is approximately $1 trillion. By 2030, the cost will double and will exceed $2 trillion. Dementia is the seventh leading cause of death, a leading cause of disability and dependency among older adults. Uh, dementia causes physical, psychological, social, and economic stress on affected individuals, their caregivers, families, and society at large. Vascular dementia is a subtype of dementia. It is an age-related um, disease of the small blood vessels in the brain. It is the second most common cause of dementia after Alzheimer's disease. However, the distinction between Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia is not clear because there is a, a significant overlap between uh, Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, such that um, Alzheimer's disease brain has evidence of small vessel disease and vascular dementia has some uh, 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 histopathological uh, mar uh, um, evidence of uh, 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 Alzheimer pathology. We have recently uh, discovered GPR39 as a potential novel therapeutic target for VCID. And I will present three pieces of evidence in support of this idea. The first, the first piece of evidence is the localization of GPR39 in the brain. This is immunohistochemistry, non-fluorescent immunohistochemistry in human brain and it shows the localization of GPR39 in blue. And you can see those blue cells surrounding capillaries. So the brown is collagen four, which is standing for GPR for uh, capillaries. And you can see GPR39 immunoreactivity is expressed on cells that surround those capillaries. You can see them here, you can see them here and here. And we think those are uh, parasites uh, which is a contractile uh, uh, cell type that recent uh, research suggests that it controls capillary blood flow, consistent with the idea that they have a role in uh, small vessel, uh, 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 potentially a small vessel disease in the brain. The second piece of evidence comes from uh, knockout mice, GPR39 knockout mice. 
Um, and what we found is that if you delete GPR39 uh, from mice, those mice will have cognitive impairment, cognitive deficit. And one of the tests commonly used to test cognitive function in mice is the water maze, the Morris water maze. And essentially what you do is you train the mouse in a water bath to swim and locate a platform. And then you measure the time and the distance they travel within each quadrant, the target quadrant where the platform is, the opposite quadrant, the right quadrant, or the left quadrant. And you ask the question, um, how much time they spent in each quadrant. And as you can see, the wild type mouse spends most of the time looking in the target quadrant, suggesting that this mouse remembered where the platform is. The heterozygote mouse, mouse did not uh, similarly spent most of its time in the target quadrant compared to the right, opposite, or left. However, the knockout mouse did not remember where the platform is and spent equal amount of time looking in each of the quadrant. So again, this is evidence of cognitive impairment in the GPR39 knockout uh, mouse. The third piece of evidence um, comes from humans. In this study, we looked at the polymorphisms, at variations in the gene GPR39 and its correlation with uh, a cognitive impairment, but also with markers of vascular dementia. And as you can see here, uh, the wild type homozygous uh, SNP or single nucleotide polymorphism was equally distributed uh, between the control um, and uh, people with a mild cognitive impairment in this study. This study had 78 uh, subjects. Similarly, the heterozygous uh, SNP was equally distributed, 14% and 12%. However, if you look at the homozygous GPR39 SNP, we had only five out of the 78, and all five were in the MCI group, and none was in the control. Importantly, if you correlate the genotype with the volume of white matter hyperintensity, which is a, an MRI marker for vascular cognitive impairment, you can see here that those five have the largest white matter hyperintensity significantly higher compared to those with wild type or heterozygous um, uh, SNP. So based on this evidence, uh, we proposed uh, three goals. First, to determine if a known GPR39 agonist can reverse cognitive impairment in the mouse model of cognitive impairment induced by high-fat diet. Uh, two, determine if blood-brain barrier penetration is required for a GPR39 agonist to protect against cognitive impairment. You can imagine a scenario where, because it's a vascular disease, the drug doesn't need to cross the blood brain barrier. But there's also um, a potential uh, reason why the need uh, for the drug to cross the blood brain barrier. So that's another goal of this uh, application. And the final goal is determine if a biased agonist, a GPR39 biased agonist, provides better protection. Uh, than uh, the broad spectrum uh, agonist and which signaling pathway is required for protection. And this is based on the idea that GPR39 has multiple signaling and, uh, and a specific signal, and some of them are protective while others may not be uh, protective. So with that, I thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. al Qaeda, for sharing your work with us. And thank you to all of our presenters for sharing their work so that we can understand better the diversity of approaches that are being pursued here to treat Alzheimer's and related dementias.